Our first speaker today will be John Hilton from my yeah, college. Uh, he is on the Ancient Scripture Department. Brother John Hilton III is an associate professor of Ancient Scripture. He's the author of over 30 peer-reviewed articles. You had that many? John, who wrote this? <laughs> and eight books. He has a variety of research interests, including the processes of learning and teaching, the Book of Mormon, and the effect of open educational resources. He has published in several journals, including Mormon Historical Studies, International Review of Research in Open and Distance Learning, Christian Higher Education, BOU Studies, the Journal of Book of Mormon and Restoration Scriptures, and the Religious Educator. John and his wife have six children, and among his favorite passions is spending time with his family, doing humanitarian service, and learning Chinese. It was my privilege to be with John a year or two ago on a tour of church history sites, and uh, found him to be a great colleague. So we're going to have John speak first, and his topic will be the first three years in Taiwan. Although the country of Taiwan is small in size, its geographical area is slightly smaller than the country of Switzerland, about one-sixth the size of Utah, the population of Taiwan is 23 million. Located approximately 100 miles east of continental Asia, the history of Taiwan is long and complicated. The history of Taiwan as a nation intersected with the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on June 4, 1956, when a ship sailing into the Geelong Harbor carried among its passengers four LDS missionaries. While this would be the first time LDS proselyting efforts had been undertaken in Taiwan, Christian missionaries had sailed into Taiwan's harbors centuries previously. The purpose of my presentation today is to provide some glimpses into the efforts of early LDS missionaries in establishing the church in Taiwan from the time period between June 1956, when the ship arrived, and June 1959, when Mark E. Peterson dedicated Taiwan for preaching of the gospel. I'll first provide just a brief background and timeline of some key events related to the history of Taiwan and Christianity in general within the country. So in 1624 is the date when first Christian missionaries most likely arrived in Taiwan along with early Dutch explorers. Spanish missionaries entered the Geelong Harbor two years later, the same harbor that would be entered by the LDS missionaries in 1956. The Dutch were expelled from the island by pro-Ming Chinese military leaders in 1662 and for the next uh, several hundred years, the, Thai country of, or the, the island of Taiwan was ruled by a Chinese government. This was the time period where Buddhism became the most common religion uh, and Christian proselyting was outlawed until 1858 when treaties allowed for missionaries to enter portions of China, including Taiwan. And at this time period, Catholics and Presbyterians were the most dominant Christian faith. In 1895, the Japanese took control of Taiwan. They continued to allow proselyting, but certain changes were inserted into Taiwan life one of which being a, a much larger role of Japanese culture and language. In fact, language proved to be difficult. There was the native Taiwanese language, there was the Japanese language, and at the end of World War II, China was re-given control over Taiwan, but China itself was in a civil war. And as a result of the civil war, the Kuomintang leaders fled to Taiwan and established the Republic of China. So this was one government that claimed the right to rule over China, in contrast to the People's Republic of China in mainland China, which also um, claimed to have that right. So there was continual tension between the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China until 1954, when the United States signed a mutual defense treaty with Taiwan, which began to ease the tension somewhat. And so it was in this setting that the missionaries arrived in Taiwan. Now the first four missionaries were elders Kitchen, Madsen, Dane, and Fish. And I'm, I, I'm excited to tell you today that Elder Weldon Kitchen is here with us. Will you give us a wave, Elder Kitchen? So he really should be giving this talk having firsthand experience. He is one of the first four missionaries to serve in Taiwan. Now, 
these, uh, of these four missionaries, two were part of the first eight. Elder Dane and Elder Madsen were part of the first eight assigned to the Southern Far East Mission, which encompassed Hong Kong, Taiwan, and other parts of Southern Far East Asia. And early on, these four missionaries were assigned to labor in Taiwan and instructed to learn Mandarin. However, this was no easy task because it was difficult to get visas to enter Taiwan. And so for a period of approximately eight months, they studied Mandarin in Hong Kong, where most people speak Cantonese. So there were difficulties associated with learning the language. However, they had great faith and confidence in their mission president, Grant Heaton. Grant was 26 years old when he was called as mission president over the Southern Far East Mission. Now, I, I mentioned the barrier of language. This is an interesting account from Elder Fish, one of the first four missionaries who's pictured here on your right. He said that even in the very beginning of their mission, before they had arrived at Hong Kong, they realized what difficulties the language would provide. He said, while on the voyage to Hong Kong, I became acquainted with a Catholic priest. When he heard that we were going to Hong Kong and would be teaching the Chinese people, and that we would be there for only three years, he laughed and said, there is no way you can be effective at all. I have studied Chinese for six years and still have trouble carrying on conversation. How do you expect to learn enough Chinese before you go home to be able to teach anything? Fish responded by saying, we believe in the gift of tongues. Now, these missionaries did believe in the gift of tongues. They also believed in the power of hard work. They spent 10 hours a day, every day, in the initial parts of their mission, working to learn Mandarin Chinese. My point in bringing this uh, episode to our attention is that several of, we'll see several parallels between LDS proselyting efforts and those of other religions that often face similar difficulties, one of which was language. Now, with respect to Taiwan, their mission president, President Heaton, had previously met with a Captain Stanley C. Samiski, an American military officer who had been living in Taiwan for a year. Samiski had been leading informal church meetings with a group of members in Taiwan and was called as branch president of the Taipei branch shortly after the missionaries arrived. The quarterly historical report for the Southern Far East Mission dated September 30th, 1958, provides a retrospective account of some of the early labors there. Arrangements had been made, this is speaking of these first four missionaries, to hold our Sunday meetings at the Taipei American School. For the first while, all meetings were conducted in English. Our tracting work began, but the work went very slow at first as our language was still very poor. The people were very kind and courteous and would listen patiently as we were sweating blood trying to speak Chinese. The studying that we had done in Hong Kong seemed to be useless. Several places allowed us to return but showed no interest in the gospel. To make matters worse, we had no literature to leave with them. It wasn't until the latter end of the summer that we received four copies of the Joseph Smith story in Chinese. In addition to difficulties with language, missionaries in the Southern Far East Mission, including not only Taiwan, but Hong Kong and other locations, found it difficult to teach investigators everything they needed to know in the few lessons typically prescribed for missionaries to teach. As a result, President Heaton created a rigorous teaching program that included 17 lessons to be taught before baptism, followed by an additional 20 lessons to be taught after baptism. Thus, if a missionary taught an individual once a week, it would take at least four months to prepare that person for baptism, which, with an additional four to five months of post-baptismal instruction. One interesting phenomenon that the missionaries encountered early on was that their movements were tracked by the Taiwanese government. Melvin Fish recorded the following of one Eva Wong. She was a member of the Chinese secret police. She was assigned to keep track of the Mormon elders. She invited us to an elaborate meal and entertainment about twice a year. It was always a pleasant event. She would ask us lots of questions. We knew that it was time for her to make her semi-annual report on us. We had nothing to hide, so we told her everything she wanted to know. That made it easy for her, and we looked forward to our dinner appointments. However, not all Christian missionaries found such a warm welcome from the government. A Christian convert a native to Taiwan named Li Go Lao shared this experience. She went back to the mountains aglow after her conversion to Christianity with purpose to bring the story of salvation to her people. But an enemy went to government officials and said Li Go Lao is using Christianity as a cloak to turn her people against the government. For now, they are beginning to respect the Christian pastors more than they do the government officials. Her activities were then sharply checked, her freedom curtailed, and she was kept under strict surveillance in her own home as if she had committed a crime. The officials came to her with fair sounding words, if you will give up this Christian doctrine entirely and not preach it anymore, we will set you at liberty at once. She answered them, 
To the end of time, I will not forsake God. It is useless to ask me to do that. But I have not spoken against your government. I am trying to teach my people to be good and to keep the laws and stop drinking and doing evil things. One can understand in an environment which was, had recently been distracted with World War II and possible tensions with mainland China, that the Taiwanese government was cautious about allowing missionaries to proselyte. However, with respect to the Latter-day Saint proselyting efforts, things went relatively well. On July 22, 1956, six weeks after the missionaries had arrived, the first LDS baptism was performed in Taiwan. Now, this was not the first baptism that the missionaries participated in because this baptism and one that followed shortly thereafter were both driven by the military members who had already been in the island. This first baptism, Thomas Kantara was a member of the military who was baptized by the branch president and confirmed by Elder Dane. His wife had been a member of the church and had slowly come into activity. Shortly thereafter, and pictured here, Richard Chin was the first Taiwanese individual to be baptized by Bob Hinckley, one of the American service members. On October 15, 1956, four additional missionaries arrived in Taiwan, bringing the total to eight. These were Louis F. Weiser, R. Michael Walker, Gary S. Williams, and Mark K. Freebairn. Michael Walker reminisced about his first day in Taiwan. He said, Elder Fish and Elder Matson had a cottage meeting that night. I thought it was quite interesting, although I did not understand a word of it. Underscoring again the difficulties with the languages. With the arrival of four new missionaries, new living quarters were found with four missionaries living in each home, which also doubled as a meeting place. While tracking was a primary approach for meeting new investigators, the missionaries also devised more creative ways of making contacts. One of these was having basketball games so that they could meet people in a less formal setting. On December 20th, 1956, the mission periodical published the following from the Taiwanese elders. They said, quote, the missionaries scheduled a basketball game between themselves and a group of Chinese army officers. We all learned that six months is a long time to be away from the basketball court. The people said that we tied with them, but they were probably just being gracious towards us. It was a good way to make friends with people and may bring contacts to the missionaries, end of quote. While the missionaries were correct that this would help them find contacts, just 11 days after this statement was published, tragedy struck that was connected to a basketball game. Keith Madsen, one of the first four missionaries to be in Taiwan, was traveling with his fellow missionaries to a basketball game, carrying a basketball in his hand when he was involved in a bike accident. He lost consciousness and never regained it. President Heaton immediately came to Taiwan and as they waited by his bedside, hoping that he would wake up, two days afterwards, Keith Madsen passed away. President Heaton recounted, I was devastated by Elder Madsen's death. Just prior to shipping the body to the United States, a dream came to me in which I was arguing with the Lord about Elder Madsen. I demanded to know why he would let such a thing happen. The answer I received was a rebuke from the Lord. He seemed to say to me, why are you so concerned about Elder Madsen? He has been called to another calling, and you do not have any responsibility over him. Why should you be angry if I have called him for my own purposes? This was not a vision, only a dream. But I awakened with a sweet, calming spirit, which took away all anger and the doubt, but not the remorse. I did surely wish the Lord had a better method of calling people he needed, and I doubted if he needed Elder Madsen as much as we did at that time. Indeed, this was a very discouraging time for the missionaries, and you can imagine... Uh, seven young men who had been living in course, close quarters with Elder Madsen feeling an extreme and profound sense of loss at his passing. Shortly after this experience, President Heaton returned to, to the mission with the intention of closing down the Taiwanese mission. Because the eight missionaries who were there had yet to baptize a single individual, and missionary work was accelerating in Hong Kong. However, Weldon Kitchen wrote of that meeting, saying, we had been at this time in Taiwan for seven months and had fallen in love with the place. Our hearts were heavy and we despaired over the thought of leaving Taiwan. We pleaded with President Heaton and begged for a little more time before making this decision. He finally conceded and told us he would wait four months before making the decision. With additional energy, we engulfed ourselves in missionary work. We pushed ourselves to the very limit." End of quote. This additional effort and the additional four months proved extremely vital for the missionary work in Taiwan. On April 27, 1957, the missionaries performed their first baptism in Taiwan in a spot up Wulai Canyon. Incidentally, if you um, Google 
Taiwan First Baptism, you'll find a recent article in the Deseret News um, where they've recently rediscovered this location and a few months ago several members or several investigators in Taiwan were baptized at the same spot of the first missionary baptisms. Let me briefly describe the first two missionary, the first two converts baptized by the missionaries. The first one was Chiu Hung Sung, and he was baptized by Elder Dane. This is a picture of him here. He had been one of the individuals with whom the missionaries were going to play basketball with on the day of Madsen's fatal accident. In Cho's own words, as he gave a retrospective account of this experience, he said the missionaries were initially quite dependent on people who could speak both languages. They were not able to express themselves adequately, so whenever I was available, I would translate and teach. Speaking of the day he was baptized, he said, I had the sense that this is where I belonged. The second person baptized that day was Tsung Yitzang. Weldon Kitchen shared the following experience in which they were teaching Brother Sung about tithing. They had been quite nervous because the Sung family did not have a lot of material wealth and they were worried that Brother Sung would reject the gospel when they taught about tithing. Kitchen recounts, I took a deep breath and presented the law of tithing, supporting the law by reading the scripture in Malachi 3, 8 through 10. When I finished, Brother Sung didn't say a word. I decided in my anxiety about the presentation, my Chinese was so poor that he didn't understand a word I said. I decided to go through it again, making sure I said each word correctly. At the conclusion, he still did not say a word. In desperation, I decided to go through the presentation one more time, making very sure I said every word perfect. When I finished, Brother Tsung looked at me and asked me a question. What is the problem, Elder Kitchen? Don't you believe it? <laughs> I was completely humbled. He had understood everything the first time through and accepted it all. The very next Sunday, Brother Tsung paid his tithing, and approximately one year later, he became the first Taiwanese individual ordained to the Melchizedek priesthood. Speaking about these two individuals, President Heaton observed, it is my impression that those people with which the elders have contacted and are holding meetings with are some of the finest in the world. It was my privilege to interview two of their contacts, Cho and Tsung, for baptism. It was a thrill to see how fully they understand the gospel and hear the testimonies they have of it. It was my feeling that the elders have some contacts who, when baptized, will establish a strong foundation, and from then on, the work will progress rapidly. Now, there were difficulties associated. One of these was the 1957 riots. Time uh, prevents my going into full detail on this episode, but these riots, um, in essence, were against the American government, and for a time, missionaries were not allowed to proselyte. This was part of a larger um, anti-American sentiment at the time, but fortunately, it soon passed. This was a one-time issue. However, there were ongoing cultural barriers. Gregory P. Hunt, in his master's thesis on evangelical techniques with Chinese Christians, noted that there were many cultural barriers to proselyting. One of those that he mentioned was ancestor worship. This was a factor for LDS missionaries as well, but a more immediate issue for them was the word of wisdom due to the common practice of drinking tea. Um, for example, one of the early converts to the church um, recounted the following. In our Chinese parties, we always toast each other. So if we don't drink coffee, wine, or tea, partners think we are very strange. To belong to a group, we have difficulties to overcome. It has been very difficult to deal with. Thus, while ancestor worship was perhaps a, a larger issue faced by many Christian missionaries, a more simple issue of tea, coffee, wine, were more important and urgent for um, the LDS missionaries. I'm gonna skip ahead um, to talk about the first Taiwanese branch. There were several, this is from the mission president, Heaton. There are several good LDS families serving in the military service in Taiwan and they have an active program in operation. There is some friction between them and the Chinese members, however. Now, although at this, in this instance, President Heaton felt the problem was going to be resolved, it was not. Some of the issues simply revolved around translation and both parties perhaps feeling that taking the time to translate meetings back and forth from Mandarin into English was taking a lot of time. And so this, this issue was resolved by forming the very first Taiwanese branch that was exclusively for Taiwanese members. Weldon Kitchen was called on April 20th, 1958 as the branch president of this branch. The branch thrived. Shortly thereafter, an activity was held in which 600 individuals, not all of whom were members of the church, attended. And this was an activity sponsored by Elder Auna, a newly arrived missionary from Hawaii. As an interesting note, many of you know that in Hawaii, there's a tradition of 
when a person begins a talk, they will say, brothers and sisters, aloha, and expect the audience to, um, to respond back. Thomas Nielsen, another early missionary in Taiwan, said that Elder Iwuna would often begin his addresses in Taiwan by saying, aloha. Elder Nielsen encouraged Elder Iwuna to at least use a Chinese equivalent. For example, zao an, when greeting church members at the beginning of this talk. Elder Iwuna reportedly did so, and if you go to Taiwan today and attend a sacrament meeting, you will notice that that tradition begun by a Hawaiian missionary continues today. Um, a sacrament meeting talk will begin with the speaker saying, brothers and sisters, zao an. The church in Taiwan began to expand. Between January of 1958 and June of 1959, six additional cities were opened for the preaching of the gospel. Tainan, Taichung, Kaohsiung, Xinchu, Chai, and Miaoli. Another interesting chapter that I'm, I'm just gonna glide past is the Relief Society. Melvin Fish, a male missionary, was the first Relief Society president in Taiwan, and he was quite anxious to work himself out of this job. Um, Chen, Chen Lin Xu Liang shared her perspective as one of the very first female Relief Society presidents and a Taiwanese Relief Society president. She said, at that time, we don't have any Chinese copy materials. Sister Johnson, who was a sister missionary bega who began training Native Relief Society presidents in 1959, gave me a Relief Society magazine. At that time, we didn't have many sisters who could understand English, so I have to teach the Relief Society lesson. The other lessons I translated into Chinese and gave the sisters to teach in the Relief Society. I was so afraid. This quote illustrates the difficulty, yet bravery, that many Taiwanese converts exhibited at this time. In conclusion, Elder Mark E. Peterson came to dedicate Taiwan for the preaching of the gospel in 1959. Elder uh, President Brent, W. Brent Hardy of the Mission Presidency recorded the effect of Elder Peterson's visit on the members of the church was great. Many of them came from 300 miles to attend the conference. While at the conference, they stayed with members, people whom they had never seen before. A spirit of brotherhood was felt among the members that was priceless. In examining the growth of the church in Taiwan, we see a pattern that perhaps can be applied at other places and in other countries. Initially, the church foothold was created by expatriate members, leading to the arrival of missionaries. The missionaries began teaching local citizens, struggling at first as they adapted to local customs, languages, and traditions. A nucleus of local members began to form, providing a solid base for additional convert baptisms, and missionary work began to accelerate. Finally, um, shortly after Elder Peterson's dedication, local members take over leadership positions in the branch. Within that month, an additional branch would open in Jilong, and Lian Jungsheng would be set apart as the first Taiwanese branch president in Taiwan. I'll end with this quote from Liang Shiwei, who is currently a stake president in Taiwan. He was, a, he was eight years old when he was baptized on the 28th of December, 1958. He said, the day of my baptism was very cold. The font was an outdoor one. Some kind member cooked a pitcher of boiled water to add to the font, but you can imagine that wouldn't help much. I was dressed in my school khaki uniform as they did not have white clothing for kids. After my dad, the first branch, or first branch president in Taiwan, baptized me, he had to carry me and run back into the building to get me changed. It was so cold, but my heart was warm, and that began, that began my life in the church, and thus began the history of the church in Taiwan. Thank you.